Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former health commissioner here in Baltimore. Our goal is to bring evidence and experience to illuminate critical public health issues. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hey, listeners, it's Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health on Call, and we want to hear from you. In more than 500 episodes since March 2020, we've been bringing you the latest on urgent public health topics like COVID-19, climate change, gun violence, monkeypox, racism, and more. We'll continue to cover these, but we'd like to know what other public health topics would you like to hear more about? Plus, you can enter to win some amazing podcast swag, including the Beach Tote featured on our Twitter account. Please go to publichealth.jhu.edu slash publichealthoncall slash survey to take a brief survey of potential future topics. This will be open until September 9th, and that link is publichealth.jhu.edu slash publichealthoncall slash survey. We're excited to hear from you, and thank you so much for listening. Today, a bonus episode on the water crisis in Jackson, Mississippi, where flooding has caused profound damage to the city's water treatment system, leaving many thousands of city residents without water. Dr. Richard Mazel, an environmental historian at the University of Houston, talks to Dr. Josh Sharfstein today about the origins of the crisis. They discuss decades of disinvestment, environmental racism, and the very real danger the crisis is now posing to dialysis patients. Let's listen. Professor Richard Mazel, thank you so much for joining me in Public Health on Call to talk about the unfolding water crisis in Jackson, Mississippi. Tell me what is top of mind for you uh, today. Well, thank you so much for having me. Top of mind today would have to be um, the the countless number of individuals suffering from chronic disease in Jackson, Mississippi and surrounding areas. One thing that we often neglect to, to understand is that for dialysis patients, they have to have potable, clean water. And this is a life or death scenario for those individuals who are undergoing dialysis and outpatient clinics three times per week. Um, or at home, uh, performing home dialysis. Fresenius and DeVita are having to ship in water to make sure that they are able to continue to provide dialysis for their patients. So some people may have this image that a water crisis is just about using bottled water, but it has immediate and potentially life-threatening effects for people who depend on health care that requires a lot of clean water. That's right. For, you know, people who have to take, you know, pills, you know, to not have water can be particularly dangerous. Having unclean water can alter your your kidneys ability to to filter water in your body. And even if we think about some of these questions, some of these um, stories that we're hearing that people are not supposed to keep their mouth open when taking a shower, that leads to a number of questions about uh, people who are immune compromised and who are suffering from long-term disease. This is a nightmare for so many people and it demands an explanation. You are an environmental historian. You've studied environmental policy, including Hurricane Katrina. When in your mind, as you're looking at what's unfolding in Jackson, Mississippi, when in your mind does this story start? Well, I think that we must think of this as a a long-term disaster, not just uh, an acute event. Um, I think sometimes we get wrapped up on this idea of, of of a disaster, something that emerges out of nowhere. This emergency is decades in the making, quite frankly, involving policy issues, involving uh, neglect of infrastructure. This disaster uh, goes back to the 1950s and 1960s when decisions were made about the infrastructure of Jackson, um, in many ways revolving around a changing demographic, um, changing identity of the city. And so this question of how policy changes and for what purpose is very important. So take us back to the 1950s, what did Jackson look like? In the 1950s and 1960s, Jackson was primarily uh, a white city. 
And similar to many cities and in, in, um, throughout the country, there was a changing demographic as white people began to move out of the city and black people began to move into the city and it took on a status as an overwhelmingly um, or predominantly black city. By the 1980s, Jackson was a predominantly black city and to this day, it remains roughly 80% black. And so, as occurred in other parts of the country, when a city changes from white to primarily minority, um, the infrastructure base changes, the tax base changes, the way the state looks at that particular city changes. Um, it becomes a food desert, a, a medical desert. It becomes difficult to access healthy foods, it becomes um, difficult to access um, physicians and specialists. So all of this then leads to um, the disaster that we see in Jackson today. Were there warning signs along the way? Yes, there have been warning signs for um, decades, if not the last five years in particular. There was a, a lead crisis in Jackson um, several years ago. You mentioned Flint. Um, one of the ideas that we have come to know in the aftermath of the Flint disaster is that there are many Flints. It was not just Flint, Michigan, but you know, Flint disaster, you know, took its shape um, in other parts of the of the country as well. So there were lead disasters in Newark and Baltimore, as well as as Jackson. And so that was a, a warning sign um, for um, the city and as well as the state. But Jackson has also been suffering from low water pressure for the last several years as well. You know, Fresenius and DeVita have been well aware of this and have had to ship in sort of tanker trucks for dialysis clinics um, because of the consistently low water pressure that Jackson residents suffer from. One way to think of environmental racism is a toxic waste dump located next to a community. But what you're describing is a different form of environmental racism, the decades long underinvestment in core infrastructure as the demographics of a city changes? No, oh, absolutely. And one of the ways that we mark citizenship in this country is access to resources, access to water. Um, not having access to safe, clean drinking water is just as much of an environmental you know, racism issue as being exposed to toxic pollution and having unclean air. This is a resource that is so necessary for so many functions of the body, um, so many functions of the body politic. So to neglect that is, in, in essence, to neglect someone's citizenship. Now, do you hear echoes of Hurricane Katrina, given your work and what's going on in Jackson? I hear echoes of Hurricane Katrina. I hear echoes of the 1995 Chicago heat wave. I hear echoes of so many disasters, particularly, you know, not just with dialysis and chronic disease, but also the, the longstanding sort of questions of how do we continue to protect vulnerable populations, groups that we know are in need of protection, but when an environmental disaster comes, we are unable to, to protect them. We haven't heard much about nursing homes yet in this disaster, but that is an issue that is always up for discussion with the disaster. It was part of her, uh, COVID, the early part of the COVID um, pandemic, um, but also Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Harvey here in Texas as well. We're seeing, you know, a lot of talk about trying to rush water to the city. What is your sense of how the response is going right now? Well, I think that using bottled water forever is not sustainable. And essentially, that seems to be how some people are looking at this and how some people have had to live their, their lives. People have been using bottled water in Flint, Michigan, since the, the disaster began. So you're talking about in Flint several years now. And even in, in the current disaster, uh, much of that disaster relief uh, involves someone getting in an automobile and driving to a, a spot where someone places bottled water into your trunk or your back seat, which number one demands that you have an automobile, that you have a way to get there and that you can get that those materials home. Those are some of the images that we're seeing there, are, you know, other sort of donation spots and, and sort of ways in which people are bringing water into people's homes. But a lot of the images that we're, we're seeing involves someone having to have an automobile. But the, the main point is 
this has to be fixed, that the, the use of bottled water for all aspects of life should not be part of our existence in the 21st century. Yeah. Now, the Flint crisis did generate a lot of national attention and ultimately a big national investment to, to replace lead pipes around the country. How do you see the potential for this situation to open people's eyes to the underinvestment in core water infrastructure? Well, I think it has a unique opportunity. As an environmental historian, you know, disasters can sometimes bring about significant policy changes. And I think that the national and even international attention that this particular moment is bringing has the potential to force the hand of the state of Mississippi and the federal government to pay more attention to water issues. In this moment, it's an issue of water scarcity, but months ago for Mississippians, it's an issue of an abundance of water. Um, Essentially, flooding is what caused this disaster in uh, in the first place, right? Um, In this immediate disaster. So dealing with the infrastructure, dealing with housing, dealing with, you know, staffing issues, um, dealing with um, emergency protocols, I think... All of these things are up for discussion and up for debate and given the right leadership, possibly policy changes. Well, that would be one of the better case scenarios if people really start paying attention to these challenges. What are you worried about given the state of the environment and and the future risks of climate change? Well, what I'm worried about is that disasters, environmental disasters are not going to cease and that there's evidence that people are subjected to increasingly um, harsh disasters, whether flooding, whether heat waves, um, whether winter storms. Um, One of the points I often make is that, you know, there's some disasters that we can expect every year, like heat waves, and particularly the elderly, individuals 80 years of old, 80 years of age and older are the most vulnerable to that. And as we have these conversations about changing planet and sort of more frequent and intense disasters, um, storms, what does that mean in terms of the most vulnerable, those individuals who are least able to protect themselves, to get into a car and and leave a, a particular place or have the access for accessible water? Um, those are the issues that I think about. So Jackson, perhaps not just as a message from the past about past failures, but also a warning about the future and what could happen if we don't take these failures seriously right now. That's correct. That's correct. I think that, um, and this again is where the policy issues play an important role. Uh, People are moving from different parts of the country, different parts of the globe into other areas. And the vulnerability that comes with certain spaces continue to, to keep many of us up at night. Well, Professor Mazel, thank you so much for coming to share your insights with us today. Thank you. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Holes Fernandez and Amber Bryan Singletary. Thank you for listening.